Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Welcome, 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 welcome. Good evening to you. Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is Pastor Al Williams here with the Men's Ministry of the Church of God of Prophecy here in the United Kingdom for another Friday night focus. Our focus for the next few weeks will be around empowering young men. And we have another discussion for you tonight. We'd like for you to participate. We'd like for you to get involved. So please don't forget how you can do so. All the chat rooms are already open. So go ahead and begin to make your comments. Also, the mobile number is here for any private texting, etc., etc., etc. And the guys are all waiting. They're ready to go, ready for the discussion. And I'm going to head on over there because we ain't got no time to waste tonight because every second count. We will do the, uh, I think Brother Rob is going to do the greetings later and to all of you that's in the chat room. But I want to say briefly welcome and we will come back to you maybe around 20 minutes time just to check on who is in the chat room. So I'm going to head on over to um, the guys and we take it from there. Guys, it's an honor to see you guys. Brother Earl is back in the house. The incredible Earl Lynch, <laughs> the amazing Rob Clark. And we've got a, a wonderful guest with us tonight. Hey, why don't you guys introduce yourself? Let me start with Rob and then go over to Earl and he will then introduce our guest who's going to speak to us tonight. Go ahead, Brother Rob. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, all, both male and female, men and women. Um, just um, just to welcome you tonight to tonight's um, show um, event, Empowering Young Men. Really looking forward to this. Um, really looking forward to hearing from Brother Dwayne, you know, Region 4, um, but I'm not going to introduce him. I'm, <laughs> after I say my look, I'm going to introduce uh, to our incredible Earl. But for those who are probably just joining for the first time or watching it, Afterwards, when the whole day is is over and you're probably sitting down in your living room or, you know, in your bedroom watching it. My name's Rob Clark. I'm from Region Four, Men's Ministry Leader um, at Small Heath Church. I got a prophecy Region Four as well. But I'm going to hand you over to my co-leader, if you like, for Region Four, uh, as well as just a, a good friend of mine, Incredible Earl Lynch. <laughs> Thank you, the amazing Rob Clark and to the prolific Pastor Errol Williams. You know, honestly, these two guys are just amazing. But I'd like to say good evening and welcome to everybody tonight who's joined us on the broadcast. It's indeed a pleasure for you to, um, for us to have you join us on this platform. You know, you've given up your precious time. I'm sure you could be doing other things and uh, watching other programs, but you've chosen to be with us and we are grateful. We are grateful and we pray that we may be enlightened as we engage in conversation and dialogue together and we grow that, um, that spiritual base and the kingdom. Um, I'd like to introduce to you um, the newest recruit to the uh, men's ministry team on a national basis. And this is a young man by the name of Dwayne McCoy. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, he is our youth um, corporate director, the corporate youth director, recently appointed into that position. And um, he shares that, I believe, with his wife, Rachel. But I'm going to hand over to him and he's going to give you a great introduction of himself. And he's also from Region 4 from uh, the Nietzsche's area. So, Dwayne, I'm going to hand over to you, my brother. All the best. Greetings, everybody. First of all, thank you for having me on the show today. Um, yes, newly appointed um, alongside my wife, Rachel, 
I think she's watching now, you know, as well. So I've, I've got to be at my best behaviour. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, as I say, I've uh, recently joined Nietzsche's Outreach Centre as well. So I'm new to Region 4. But yeah, I'm just happy to be on the show and, and, and to be able to support our men and in empowering our men going forward. Over to you, Dwayne, do your presentation. Go ahead, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Errol. So we go to the top slide, please. Perfect. So yeah, um, today um, um, I was given the task of bringing a 10 minutes presentation in regards to empowerment, but I wanted to bring it from a youth point of view and um, engage that along with the men. And how I see the goal of youth empowerment anyway is to help young people develop their ability to make decisions for themselves. Um, I naturally have a son. Uh, he, he has a bike with stabilizers, so he rides. I take those stabilizers off. I hold the bike whilst he's riding, but eventually I want to give him, I want to empower him to be able to ride himself. So if we go to the, if we go to the next slide, I'm going to uh, point out two key things for me that it really uh, touched home for me anyway. And it was being absent. So the lack of, ab the lack of absence. And um, in regards to that, we speak about the fatherhood and the lack of that and the impact it has on our generation, on our, on our young people on our young men and also the level of unequalness for me that's a plays a massive role it's a bigger role than what than just going across and speaking to a young person um a young a young man a, a young male it's it's much bigger than that and as i go to the next slide what you start to see now are some of the reasons for it so for example unemployment rates were significantly higher for ethnic minorities at 12.9 percent compared to 6.3% for white people. Black Caribbean mixed, white, black Caribbean children have rates of permanent exclusions about three times that of, that of the um, pupil population as a whole. 30.9% of Pakistan, pa Pakistanis or Bangladeshis, people live in overcrowded accommodations, while black people, the figure is at 26.8%. And for white people, it stands at 8.3%. As I go to the next slide, uh, sorry, and that's from the race report from the Equality of Human Rights Commission as well. So that's something that can be available to anybody to see for themselves. This is from the Prison Reform Trust, the Romney Brief in Prison, prison, and it says that black men are 20, 26 percent more likely than white people to be remanded in custody. They are also nearly six percent more likely to plead, plead not guilty. And this is the interesting one for me. The next one is between the age of 18 to 20 years old have the highest level of black asian and minority ethnic BAME, obviously over representations in adult estates of all age groups so when we when we when, we, when i read that i thought where is the early intervention how can we stop our young men in the age category from from um from getting themselves um in prison next and as I go to the next slide, you'll see more about the uh, problems in education. So this is again the Black, Black Caribbean achievements in schools in England. And some of the reasons for this, or some of the factors, are head, um, head teachers, poor leadership and equality issues, teachers low expectations, curriculum, relevance and barriers, lack of diversity in the workforce, lack of targeted support, negative peer pressure, cultural clashes and behavior, exclusions as we read earlier schools ability and um, group and, and lower tier and entry and the labeling of issues with in grade predictions as something that's probably more relevant now with the COVID situation uh, in regards to grades and the impact and the effect it's had on our young men in particular the next slide speaks more about the parenting aspect so um lack of parental uh, aspiration and low expectations 
um, part of that I can I can sort of um, I can sort of read into this really because growing up there was a there was a low expectation for me if that makes sense I just wanted to get a job you know and 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 that's what it was and sometimes that's the um, lack of that's the expectations that we have sometimes in our communities. Next one is uh, low literacy levels and language barriers, absent fathers, as we spoke about earlier, single parent families, and young men that are having kids at a young age that are having to having that are um, having to have more pressure on themselves to not just cater for themselves but to cater for an, another child. We got the we got the disadvantage again of the poverty. We, we know about that, and we got poor housing. So the next slide is my testimony, really regards to the context that we've read. Culture, um, I was told, I would say in Patwa, but my Patwa is uh, very poor, so I'm going to say in proper English. So uh, I was told that money doesn't grow up on trees, you know, and, and constantly when you're hearing that, it, it kind of made me just want to just, just go out there and find money, work, find something. As I got older, I got more pressured. So yeah, you start to, as you get older, you start to see people in in, in these fancy trainers and you think man i need to get involved i need I, I'm, I'm under pressure here i'm, I'm not doing anything doing anything with, with myself however with the lack of opportunities and etc it's it's very it's very hard lack of role models outside i find it very and i'll say it as it is that the church leadership should i say I, I i found i didn't find that much um i didn't find much places to go to it was um somebody said to me a friend of mine said to me that one of the differences with the mosque is that they they leave the mosque open all day and it was diff and and with church I, I kind of feel as though sometimes we lack the authority on the outside um school this is a very important one for me because i i'm not too sure if you picked it up yet but i grew up um, with a stutter so in school and and a bit like most actually uh, in school i i in english class we used to read out and I always used to get myself sent out of school purposely um, because I was just, I was scared. I was shy and I was just, I was just, it was just difficult for me to overcome that barrier. And one of the things I learned in growing up is that our behavior is a form of communication sometimes. And we have to read that to be able to bridge that gap with our young men in particular. Um, lack of understanding again for a uh, financial understanding I was speaking to a, a guy and he's in the process of buying his house. And I said to him, um, and he said to me, oh, Dwayne, I guess how much I've saved. And he told me the figure and I was like, wow. And he goes, yep, I was taught early from my father. My father taught me how to save. And that's something that I wasn't taught. I was taught to, to buy uh, the latest de designers, <laughs> which now are, are obviously no, don't fit me now. Anyway. <laughs> um, we have, then we have, have the um, local know in the local environment can have massive influence in the direction that you go and that's something that we have to think about again and when I'm saying this some of these things are more political um, some of these things that we need more more by young men in those high positions um, yeah is early intervention which um, I'm very much a part of really is when what what age do we wait for something to happen before we become before we start to build relationships or can we can we go there and build a relationship before the mistake is made and that's something that is on my heart in particular you know what signs what kind of things do we do we need to do to to get there first before they make the first mistake and as we go to the next slide we're just gonna go i'm just gonna um yeah, this is just a little thing, really, um, in particular at work. One of the things I try not to do is I don't want it to be a case of me telling somebody or, or some telling somebody what to do. Um, the, the process that I try and carry out is that they, they, see, they see the problem and they're able to figure it out themselves. They're able to see. So the effect of me almost teaching themselves how to how to overcome how to become better young males and that's a technique that sometimes i um would love for more men to construct and understanding of relationships between yourselves and others 
in the next slide, um, I speak about yeah, the next slide I speak about leaders, and this is sort of me challenging everybody. Really, you know, um, for me, I love a goal, and when you when you can get a goal, you can then start to challenge it. You've got something to look forward to, and that's that's a big thing for me because once you have built that relationship, you can then challenge. You can say, look, look. Look, Dwayne, you, you you need to you need to do this better if you want to achieve this goal. And the good thing about goals and objectives is that they don't need to stop. In work, we do the philosophy is continuous improvement. Um, it doesn't stop. We continually improve, and we continue change the goal when we need to. And that also is something that I'm much more. Uh, well, I'm a big I'm a big fan of. So that, that's just me challenging leaders um, in in giving having goals for our young people having objectives targets so that they can be challenged in in their empowerment to achieve it um and then and the next slide is a sort of um me giving a way of how this might happen i think sometimes we fall into this category where we say oh young man a, a job and that's okay but sometimes what we need to do is say to them what excites you um, what excites you? And obviously I put faith in brackets there because it needs to re obviously remain within our faith. But what, what excites you? So um, I'll give an example. Um, if somebody comes up and says, I'm into healthy, healthy eating, then how can we empower that, that sort of, that target, that strategy? How can we target that and make it into something where it impacts not only him because it's something that he he's excited about but it impacts others he calls his friends he says oh you know i'm doing this thing monday meals i'm doing this um healthy dieting you know i'm, I'm you know and that's something that i believe that we must do more of listen understand what excites our young people and see if it's something that's relevant and uh and and, and something where we can empower them to achieve and my, and my last slide, um, I just wanted to put something in there where I was just, I really, really um, was encouraged by um, really the way Joshua was was empowered, to be honest. Um, again, I'm just going to quickly go through this. So Joshua was, was given an opportunity to walk with Moses, which is good because it's good when you walk with another elder. Uh, uh, you know, it's good because you can, you, you know, it's it's there, there are things that you just, you can't pay for. You know, you can't pay for, you can't do a degree sometimes. Something, sometimes you need to walk with another man. Um, Joshua was challenged by Moses. Moses, Moses prepared Joshua to receive the baton. And Joshua was able to step up and lead. And that's sometimes a quick, short little clip, really, of what sometimes empower, empowerment can be for our young men. And, um, yeah, that is the end of my slide. I hope you've... Um, gained or got something from it. I hope I was uh, stayed within the 10 minutes, uh, Pastor Errol. <laughs> and yeah, um, over back over to you. <laughs>
Mm. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> we got brother Andrew Allen. I think he's still in Canada. You have to let us know. Yes. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. Uh, Sister Talma Jarris, good evening to you. Uh, Sister Jean Taylor, good evening. Calling us three wise men and pastor. So pastor is above wisdom, you know, pastor and the three wise men. You see that? You see where we're going with that one? I like that one. Sister Maxine Makuna, I know that lady. Yes, one of, one of my favorite sister-in-laws, I have to say that. Um, Sandra Mia Designs.com, good evening. Good evening. Good to see you again. Um, Sister Marie Memoirs, well, okay. Good evening, everyone. We'll have to elaborate on the memoirs. I feel like there's a bit of a creativity there. Sister Jenny L. Wilson, 21. I feel like I should know you with the name Wilson. Greetings, everyone. And then Sister Elaine, she's applauding, and I suspect it's the presentation because um, I can see Sister Sophia Sutcliffe. I think that's connection to Mr. McCoy. <laughs> um, good evening. Um, Sister Rose Suarez, or Saw Suarez, and um, please correct me, uh, and apologies. Good evening um, to you, and Sister Paulina Dongo. Yes, it's been a long time, I haven't seen a song from Sister Paulina Pasta. We need to get yes, a song from her, Sister really Paulina. Good. Yeah, and, and Sister Le Leanne Jacobs, wow, good evening, good evening. To talk about handing over the mantle, we, we're getting a number of uh, high profile on tonight, Pasta Eros. So, uh, very good to see Sister Leanne Jacobs as well. So good evening all, and I'm looking forward to the feedback um, from the awesome presentation we've just had from Brother Dwayne. I'll hand over back over to, uh, to Pastor Errol. Well, I wanted, I wanted Brother Dwayne, first of all, just to explain who Maria's memoirs is. So go ahead and explain who she is for us. Well, um, she goes by the name of Anne-Marie Sutcliffe. I call her trouble, um, but uh, yes. Um, you, call her, you call her what? <laughs> trouble. <laughs> trouble. Okay. She's, she's always supposed to be trouble, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To me, I should give her to be honest, so I'm going to give her the, the plaudits, you know. She loves it. She's, she's very creative, so yeah. Yeah. Thank you very and, much, Amory. And, and tell, tell us how, how is she related to you? So she's my sister-in-law. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate that very much. And uh, thank you so much for your um, presentation. I'm going to start with Earl, really. And mm -hmm. um, just just maybe, Earl, uh, just one key thing for the time being that you picked up out of this presentation. I mean, I picked up four major things, which I'm really so excited about. Let me start with you. Just one, just one, because I know you picked up four and ten. <laughs> you're right you're right i mean Dwayne, you mentioned so many things from absent fathers young people having children at an early age being unequal you talked about unemployment exclusion from school overcrowding you you went a lot but the one thing that i would pick up on is about the poor expectation from teachers i have personal experience of that and that is one of the most disempowering things that can ever happen to a young man or a young woman when you look up to your teachers and your teacher tells you that no one from this school will ever become a doctor you know it, it it's it's something that you don't want to hear um, and that's a personal experience that I've been through but I can imagine even to this day in 2021, if a teacher told a young man or a young woman, particularly a black young man or a black young woman that nobody from this school will ever become, and you can insert the title of any job after that, I think that would be one of the most disempowering things that we could ever imagine. And then you went on to talk about low expectations from parents. You imagine if you're that kid who's told from your school teacher, and then you're told the same thing from your parent. I can imagine that must be absolutely devastating. So if we're talking about empowering our young, we've got to be encouraging to them. We've got to be realistic, but you know, they've still got the world ahead of them and they can change direction. So it was interesting. And I wish we could give you more time to literally go into detail in each of the points that you raised. But if there was one thing I was going to pick out from everything that you said, it was that you know teachers can quickly disempower young young people through through just saying an unkind word and not thinking through what they're saying 
to the young people that's supposed to be encouraging. Excellent, excellent, excellent point. Rob? Yeah, um, there is one thing, but I have to say, um, Brother Dwayne, welcome to the club of stutterers, because that's how I am. <laughs> I, I'm one of them. I am one of them. So, right, and, and, and somebody put it this way to me, and I had to laugh, because I thought, yeah, man, that made me feel good. Um, he said to me, he was a, he's an elderly Asian guy, he says, Rob, I've learned that stutterers, they stutter because they're clever. And he says, they're clever. And they've got so much things they want to say so quickly. They have to take their time because they're so excited. And I says, yeah, that's me. So, Dwayne, welcome to the Club of Stutterers. It's a sign of cleverness. All right. And look at Moses. But, but, but what I liked um, in particular, on the line of um, Brother Earl, is the bit about education. And in particular, the financial education that you touched on. Mm. I know you were you know, speedily going through it, but it's a powerful point you make. And I don't know if people realise. And, that, you know, in fact, people don't realise education full stop. When you are not educated, you don't see it. <laughs> you might think you're educated. And you only kind of really stick out when you're with, with a group of educators. And it doesn't necessarily mean, I don't know, that you've got a, a degree as such, you know, that kind of qualification. But when you're not taught something and you're around people who are taught and you gave good examples, it sticks out and it puts you at a disadvantage. You might be confident in yourself and often your passion will sell you often. But there's times when education, you just need it to get to that next level. And I, and I love the few pointers you put out there. And it might be worth just flicking back to the slides or watching it later, those who are watching, because you put some real research behind the stuff you presented. And in particular, education. I am at the age of 50 plus now. I can gladly say, and I'm boldly saying, and I'm realizing how much education is important, but financial education, not to necessarily make yourself rich, but to be good stewards. So yeah, take my hats off to your presentation today and welcome on board. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you spotted that one because I didn't spot it actually. And I'm so glad you mentioned yeah. it. Uh, really mm. am. Uh, Dwayne, um, you mentioned quite a few points and I know that um, Earl mentioned about more time and, and, and surely true. I think oftentimes, um, you know, people given 10 minutes to bring out the points even better than if they had two days. Mm -hmm. and, um, if you were to just pick one of your points out of all the points you've raised, the most empowering one, mm -hmm. the most empowering thought that you shared with us, what, which one would you choose? If you, was, if, if you only had, let's, let's assume you were to travel around the, the, the world, just go into schools to, to meet young men, whether in prison, um, institution and you, you only had time for one thought what would that one be out of all that mm. you shared um, well it's a difficult one um, I, I would say I would say the lack of a parental um, aspiration and low expectations um, the reason why I say that is because it affected me in growing up, in being able to vision, um, in, in being able, to be honest, as soon as I left school, I wasn't thinking about being an engineer. I wasn't, I was, I wasn't aware of being, uh, doing apprenticeships. I, was, I wasn't aware of going as high as, a, high as I could, if that makes sense. I was, I was just aware of how can I, where is, who, who would hire me basically? And that kind of affected me having that low expectations from, from, um, from a young age. Um, mm really really um hindered should i say hindered you know hindered you, you know slowed my progress i'll say that um yeah mm. oh, well well i want to tell you tell you the three of your story very short story um about my life i was on my way from jamaica to england at the age of 12. i put this in my first book and a member of my family stopped the car because there's only one route in Jamaica to some places and she blocked the road and she told me a, she said these are the words she said for a 12 year old kid she said you'll never make it you'll never achieve 
you are worthless. This is a, I'm 12. You're useless and you will end up in prison. And she said a few more things. It's in my book. And do you know that, Brother Earl, I want to start with you. Every one of the things she said came true. <laughs> I was 12 years of age. You're talking about empowering young men. And, and it's only when um, Earl mentioned about poor expectation from teachers, but then he said low expectation from parent because the person mm -hmm. was a, in a parental position. Yeah. You mean, it wasn't my mother or my father, but the person was in a parental position. And these yeah. were the these were the words that were spoken into my life. You talk about what they talk about mm -hmm. um, putting a curse over you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you're what less. I don't know if you heard those words, Rob. You're what yeah, yeah. you know, These are some of the mm -hmm. words. You're what less. You're no good. You're useless. You're mm -hmm. good for nothing. This is, this is what I heard for many, many, many moments. So everything said about the prison, about the what less. I couldn't read until I was around 25. <laughs> <laughs> that was the reality uh, and mm. i just want us to talk about that for a moment if you if you don't mind because i think from yeah. what you've just said you know this is where it starts isn't it brother let me start with you brother mm. Earl. This, isn't this where it starts in the home it is it, it can so quickly destroy a young man and a young woman but i'm going to focus on a young man because i know what it's like to have um a parent who can empower you with their words and i know mm. what it's like to have a parent who can disempower you with their words if i give you an example my dad used to um he used to uh, frequent the pub uh, where uh, other black caribbean men used to often um, attend and um when i was um 16 i wanted to go to college and um my mom and dad had an argument because i wanted to go to college and my mom said yeah let the boy go to college because he wants to do medicine and my dad said, no, make him find a job because, you know, he has to contribute toward the house. He has to contribute toward the bills and contributing toward the bills, by the way, meant paying for his drink and paying for his bookie and paying for that. You know, so there were different paradigms. So you got to look where the parent is coming from sometimes. And, you know, my dad said, no, you mustn't go to college. And I, I've heard, I heard mom and dad argue for me not to go to college and to go to college. My mom was extremely um, bold and she insisted that I go to college. My mom was the empowering one. You know, over the years, my father did change. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, my, my father spoke very, very eloquently about his children said, you know, we've never gone to prison or we've never got ourselves in trouble with the police or anything. And he was very proud and he spoke very proudly of us later on in life. But just imagine I had listened when I was 16. Well, my father, no, I'm if you go to school or college, so I'm oh, about a father. You know, I could quite easily have ended up, you know, in a very, very different place to where I am now. And we need to hear our parents encourage us, encourage us in our passions, encourage us in the things that we want to do, especially if we have good intention to do education and study and, you know, potentially to get a degree. It's not for everybody. I agree. It's not for everybody. But we often find it so easy to close our young ones down rather than to lift them up. And it's so important that at that early age that we not only hear it from our parents, but we hear it from our teachers as well. So... I can't stress how important that is, you know, and even when our young ones come to church, we've, yeah, we've got to call out the bad behavior, yes, but we've got to be encouraging. We've got to keep giving them aspirational views of what they can be. Think about what you want to have, what you want to be, what you want to do, what you could potentially be. We've got to keep looking at the potential of what's possible with these young men and women. And not only that, you know what? We've got to look at the potential of people who are middle-aged and people who are old because some people, when they get to my age, they feel that's it. They, they can't do any more. No, I'm just living my best life right now. I don't know what's going to be on the doorstep next week, next month, next year, but I'm looking forward. I've got to constantly look forward to something bigger and better. We've got to empower ourselves with continuous professional development. And um, I love where you went with that, but uh, I think that's one area that we've really got to focus on looking forward and keep lifting people up rather than pulling them down. Mm. Mm. You're on mute, sir. 
All right, sorry about that. I want you to address the same point, but I want to also bring up another. I want to bring up a picture of something that you mentioned, and I think um, um, then I want to hear from um, Dwayne. And, and it's this point here by Nelson Mandela, and he said, "Education is the most powerful." weapon we can use to change the world and mm. here here i am you know 12 years of age i should be on the route to education i should be um just you know just part way through if you like you know whether halfway or so through but here i am being educated that i'm no no good i'm stupid i'll never make it here's brother earl um, have it, he listening, in fact, hearing a fight going on about his education. <laughs> I mean, mm. how, how mm. Dis disempowering is that? Mm. It's, it's very disempowering, isn't it? And, um, you know, we've touched on a wide spectrum already. Um, and I love how um, Brother Dwayne has planted the seed when you asked him the question, if there's one thing, and he, and he kind of shared with us, you know, honestly about his upbringing, you know, and how that has had uh, an impact, you know, mm -hmm. a hindrance, he put it. And um, you, sh you then shared, Pastor Errol, that the wrong type of encouragement, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. makes you believe mm -hmm. that. And so you acted it out, you know, for you mm -hmm. to actually mm -hmm. tell us tonight that everything she told you, you believed everything. and you did it. Mm -hmm. You, you see, yeah. and um, and but brother El just you know again shared, you know some of his upbringing and and the perspective that he was growing up in, and and it's the same with, with me. I mean, I love my mom and dad. I, you know, I am a product of my mother and father, and they're both alive. Um, did did um, did they teach me about education? No, not at all. Do I blame them? No, not at all. I, you know, what they taught me was manners and respect. The little bit they knew, they spoke positively. I cannot recall in my life a time when they spoke negatively about me, even when I upset them, even when I embarrassed them. Don't get me wrong, because, you know, Caribbean, Caribbean parents can be, when they need to discipline, they can discipline you. I'm just thank, thank goodness for the, the laws changed that they have to now think three times before they can go that, that way, you know. But my parents, you know, as much as they encouraged me, they couldn't encourage me about education like how some others had. Why? Mm. Because they hadn't experienced it. How can they teach me something that they hadn't experienced? But what they knew, they taught me. And what and I, what I love about my parents, they did it through action. It was less of the talking, but more of the doing. My dad's not the most educated, and not to say to embarrass him, but he uses his character to get to where he needs to get to. Throughout his life, he showed his practical skills, and you know he's got loads of things that are still in the house, in the back garden, or on the wall that he's created, and it's lasted years. It's it's not something you'd buy from IKEA. But in dad's eyes, it's the most beautiful thing. And in my eyes, it's the most beautiful thing. And guess what? I've been brought up that way. I create things. This is what's caused the creativity in me. My mom was a very good admin, shorthand, mm. this, that, and the other, typist. So, and, you know, so my son, if you know what the clock is, you, you, you know, but they encouraged me all the way through, even when they didn't know about um, university. I didn't know about university until I went to college by accident. I didn't even know about college until it was by accident. I, I got myself into a job at the age of 15 and a half, 16, me thinking it was a good thing. The career officer was really trying to get me out of school because I was no good, you know, and got me into a factory. But I learned for myself what I needed to do. And I, I, I blagged it into, into college with no qualifications. I had to knock on the door of the, of the of the Don and and tell him I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna do this with no qualifications. And it was only through my, my I'm gonna say my IQ, because you talk about the top five percenters, apparently my IQ was that high, he could he, he had no choice but to let me in. But what I'm I'm saying all this because my parents didn't know about that. I had to learn that for myself. But what they taught me helped me to get to that next level. My personality 
is a product of my mother and father. So I always look at that. I mean, it was only last year, and I hope I'm not talking too long. It was only last year I was talking to somebody. He was talking about. He was asking me to mentor uh, and some some students in Birmingham University. And, you know, he was going into detail. He says, Rob, you know, I ask people to mentor and they don't get it, but you get it. You know, tell me about your education. I told him and he couldn't understand why my parents hadn't put me onto that level. But I says, not every parent knew, knew about that and knows about that. Mm. But what they did mm. teach me, it still got me to where I need to get to. You know, so every, every road is different. And so we need to um, really, as you say, um, continue to feed that generation. That's why I'm involved in mentoring the Black Boys Can, the men's ministry, mm. the youth, because, you know, I know where I'm coming from. And the little bit I know, yeah, I want to I wanna plant it so that they grow twice, three times greater than me. Mm. That's, that's powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Dwayne, what's your thoughts on what you've heard from even what Brother Earl has said, and maybe even my story? And I, I want to put this picture back up because I think this is really, we're touching on something really powerful here tonight. Because uh, let me just make this point as well that come to me. We're talking about empowering and disempowering. But in a way, the person that did that to me empowered me to do negative. I don't know, if, which is still disempowerment. I, I, I just want to show your point because I went the complete opposite direction but i i i i it's almost you know i went onto the street and i got a gang and and i'm doing all of those things and i'm i'm making lots of money i'm making thousands of pounds don't get me wrong are you with me i'm but it, it ended me up in prison it ended me up in the wrong way does that are you with me but i in one way one could look at it to say well i was empowered in a negative sense does that make sense um, you know, even though it sent me the opposite direction, but I still accept the point of disempowerment. What's your thoughts, Dwayne? Yeah, um, and that's exactly what it can do. It can make you think that something else is good when really mm. it's bad. Mm. And that's um, uh, sometimes when someone says or disempowers you, you take, you, you almost take what's there, You, if that makes sense. You almost run to the nearest corner run to the nearest thing and that's so, and that's sometimes the the problem with, with again disempowerment is that you can end up running to the wrong thing right. um yes. Yes. yeah yeah you can end up running to the wrong <laughs> thing even though it seems good even though it gives you some of the things that look good it's the mm -hmm. um like the wrong um mentality the wrong vision really um mm -hmm. And yeah, and 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 that's what, and that's exactly what. Um, again, uh, listen to what Rob said. It's it's um, the reason why I kind of say it is because, just like Rob, I want to feed into that generation and show them that even though this is what we had, even though this is what I had, mm. you can have better. Um, um, it 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 slowed my progress, but didn't stop me. And that's and that's the main message that I want to. Um, put out mm. to all our young men today is it, it slowed our progress but it didn't stop me and we can mm. we, we can sit here and stand here today um a men's ministry you know having mm. this conversation because of that you know that's the greatness of god you know and really it's 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 for me i want to try and feed in as early as possible um you know it's difficult when you go to church because you see young men or men you see them for a couple of sometimes a couple of minutes, you know, and then, mm. and then they're gone. So then it's how mm. do you get, how do you build that relationship? Because when you go back home and without being rude, if they're going back home into a household that's just playing certain music all the time and they're having parties, mm. Mm. then, you know, on one side they're getting an hour and a half, two hours of church and then getting another 30, 50, 60 hours yes. of, 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 yes. of, yes. of the wrong stuff, if that makes sense. So yes. it's about yes. how, how, how do I get into that place? And how do I just mm. keep seeing that? How do I make mm. that person um, or young man see mm. the goodness, see the light, even though he's heading into probably back, back to the dark, mm. he can still have that light, that, that hope, mm. you know, that stage, you know, mm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run Duane because I'm stuck in this situation. You know, um, mm. like I've, I've got some young people that are, um, I challenged them last year because they, they were leaving college 
but they didn't know what they wanted to do. So they wanted to get a job. So I challenged them. I says, what about uni? What about uni? You know, um, and in the end, you know, we've seen a result of two young guys church that have now gone to university, which is mm. not saying it's my fault, but it's just a little bit of that, that, that one little conversation sometimes changes situations, if that makes sense. Which, mm. So yeah. really, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, really relatable today. Anyway, um, yeah, everything that everyone's saying, really relate. Earl, Earl, I, I want to come to some statistics in a moment, but I, I, I have to tell you the story. It's a short one. I was in a club once. I was on the streets. I'm in a club. I used to sleep on the streets and all kind of stuff. Sleep in dustbins. You know those big dustbins, the metal ones. Yeah, yeah. I used to live. Okay. I used to live in those. Uh, oh yeah, I, I mean I've been around. But I want to tell you the story. I was in a club once and. There was um, a, two men in front of me. I was a young boy. I could be around 15, 16. And two men was in, in front of me, senior men. They're senior to me. And for what reason this man asked me this question, I, until today, I can't tell you. And the question he asked me, he said, young man, how many girlfriends you have? So I said, one, sir. And this is what he said next. He said, so what are you going to do when that one leave you? <clears throat> Now, the way I interpret that was, and in my environment was, having one girlfriend was not enough. enough. Mm. So then I went on a, a serial <laughs> situation mm -hmm. where I now had five and six. If I went to Birmingham, I have one. If I go to Leeds, mm. I have one. If I go to Brixton, I have one. And, and that kind of lifestyle. But I want you to hold that in mind. But I want you to look at these statistics and tell us why do you think this is the case that it's so disproportionate and you know in terms of black men we are full in the prison we are the ones filling the prisons we are yeah. the ones being excluded from school the most we are the yeah. ones that's not being employed the most we are the ones getting the lowest degrading position in some extent why yeah. is this i i think it starts way way back and it and i would say it probably starts around school age and it, it, it's 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 a natural progression as you move through the years so imagine mm. right you're in your third year at secondary school you know you, you're with your mates and it's time to choose your options and you're, you're choosing your options because you want to make sure you get a decent career i mean in the 70s when i was at school right um, you either became a factory worker if you were a man or you drove the buses or you as a woman would go to probably work in a factory or you'd go into the hospital and become mm. uh, a, a nurse or go into nursing. So if your aspirations are crushed at 13, 14, 15, you will get frustrated. And your frustration is such that you, you probably won't want to get educated. You think now, well, what a waste of time. I don't want to do that because one of my teachers even said, well, Ill, put, forget doctor, maybe male nurse. Well, I, I don't want to be a male nurse. So it wouldn't be a surprise for me to be disruptive in class. And if I was disruptive enough, the easiest way to control a, a, a black guy is just exclude him. Don't try and work with him. Don't try and rehabilitate him. Just exclude him because it's too much effort to try and, you know, fix these young young people, you know? And the paradigm from um, many of the teachers may be, look, that's just a bridge too far. Let's just exclude him. Let him, let him go home and let him mm. think about his ways. Now, if you do that, then it doesn't take too long before gang members see enough excluded young men and say you know what i can give you a little job just do a little run for me it's just over in telford maybe 20 miles away from me you know nobody will know you over there just do this drop for me and then come back now if that boy gets arrested or if that girl gets arrested now they're part of the judicial system now they could stand a chance of getting themselves into um, um, into a custodial sentence. So it, it's a natural consequence. You know, it's, it's just an extension of what happens from that early age and it rolls into different phases of your life. And the older you get, 
the more of a look at custodial sentences you'll get. And if you get a custodial sentence or if you don't have a decent education, do you think you're going to get decent housing? No, they're all interrelated. Every one of those things is interrelated. And if you don't get a decent job, then how are you going to get a mortgage? And how do you get yourself out of living in the ghetto if you live in a ghetto? Or how do, where are you going to live once you leave mom and dad's house? Because you can only stay in mom and dad's house for so long. And no wonder we're seeing statistics that say, you know what? I haven't got myself in trouble, but mom and dad, they're, they're looking after me. I can't afford it to, to live in my own house right now. So I'm going to be staying at home. No wonder Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Caribbean often stay at home longer. Maybe for the for the Asians, there's a slight cultural difference there because they actually don't mind staying together for a while until they can literally send somebody away with a package of a wife and a house. It's, so it's different in Asian culture. But for us, you know, if we, if we don't get an education, and Mandela was right, if we don't get an education, we see ourselves on a continuous downward spiral where we... Uh, we can't get decent housing, we can't get decent mm. jobs, we don't have a decent education, and this becomes intergenerational if we're not careful. So, mm. you know, when Mandela says that education is the key, trust me, it's a huge part. It's a huge part of us being able to make a valuable contribution to society. Huge. Yeah, thanks for that. R Rob, this... One of the thoughts that comes into my mind is almost as if somebody is up to something. Um, or is it that, I don't know, or is it that, you know, young black have fallen into a particular situation where a lot of these statistics have been the same for I don't know how many years. I've been, I've been hearing these statistics for at least 40 years. So mm -hmm. it seems as if something, there, it, it, the, the word is conspiracy that comes up in my mind. I don't know if you see it that way, mm. but maybe I'm wrong. Mm. What's your thought? Mm. Um, I, I don't see it as conspiracy. It doesn't mean that I'm right. But I'm on the same page and the same road as um, Brother Earl. Um, and I said it before Nelson Mandela said it tonight. Education is key, you, you know, And because you asked the question. And what, what's linked to all these statistics Why you say conspiracy is the lack of education. This is what Nelson Mandela is talking about. You look at Africa, the whole country of Africa is rich with resource, but yet so many black people, you know, are still left with crime. And the next bit is poverty. Yeah, the lack of education often leads to poverty. That lack of education of not knowing what to do with your resource leads to poverty. And so they don't then understand how to make good with the resource they've got around them. And then those that are educated and have educated themselves, because don't forget the Egyptians were the most educated people in the world, you know, in Africa, you know, most of the, the science, you know, fact comes from, you know, you know, but what's happened along the way, you know, things have been robbed. And so that's probably where the conspiracy comes into it. But if I bring you back to the statistics that you showed earlier, it's mm. a, it's a lack of education that leads to the poverty. And there's one thing we don't mention that I want to mention talking about and linking it to empowerment and something I talked about only yesterday, in fact, is self-esteem. Because when you've got a lack of education and you're living in poverty, and then you see somebody who seems to be more successful how does that make you feel? It makes you feel less. And then you have a lower self-worth, self-value, and you start to mm. behave a certain way. And I, and I said to, to, the, to the candidates, uh, uh, you know, the lack of self-esteem, you know, it, it, it impacts you. It's the greatest possession that we've got, self-esteem. We're in control of our own self-esteem. But the environment environment makes us think about ourselves less, yeah. yeah. And it affects our emotional state. And guess what happens? You have a lack of confidence. You struggle to understand just the meaning of life. You feel rejected. You start to want to belong to gangs. You know, you, you, you live with the criticism, as Pastor Elio mentioned, and the shame, because there's a lack of low self-esteem. And we live with that hostility. 
And you know what else happens? You start to abuse in alcohol, drugs, sex, mm. crime, mm. addiction. All of this arguably comes from a low self-esteem. And so, you know, we, and I have to bring and conclude, as Christians, yeah, we know that we've got a God that is on our side. And we've got to lean not on our own understanding and think we can make it through life on our own understanding and understand that relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, allowing the Spirit to, you know, to rule us, firstly through our spirit, then our soul, and then our body. Often we are reacting the wrong way around. We are looking for those selfish things of the body and then trying to feed our, our soul and spirit the wrong way around. So all of this, conspiracy or not, we can do this by the renewing of our minds, but we've got to allow the Holy Spirit. That's the only way, you know, with the disadvantages that we've had in this life. I can see Brother Earl's hand up, so I won't take much of the space, but um, <laughs> that's my response. Mm. Well, one second before you come in, uh, uh, Brother Earl. Uh, let me just show you a picture. I'm going to let you speak in a moment, Brother Earl, once again. Let me show sure. you a picture, something something that I saw. That um, I, I go to schools and I do a lot of presentation to, to children. And I want to show you a picture. Every time I go into the waiting room of these schools and I'm waiting, mm -hmm. the, every school, this is, I'm talking about six, six, six year olds, seven year olds, eight year olds, six, six age. When I say school, I mean primary, you know. Primary. And every time I'm waiting in the waiting room, I have a habit of watching the, the board. Now I'm trying to show you what, what the point is. And when I look on the board, they always have all the staff on the board. All the staff are on the board. And in every school, I have a habit of counting the amount of um, staff that's on it. And normally, it's around 60. 58, 59, 60. 55 of them are female, generally speaking, mostly white. And maybe around three or four men. So it seems to me that a lot of our young black boys and the young men are not seeing men in the education system. They're also seeing mm -hmm. white women. And the reason, one of the things that I've seen, I don't know if you ever watched this film, and I'm sure you might have um, seen it. It's, it's not a film, sorry. It's a kind of a documentary. Blue Eyes and Brown Eyes. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. You, okay. Yeah, so well. if you've got teachers who are prejudice and racist and who are having low expectation of black boys how are they going to pass how are they going to get anywhere <laughs> no no i wouldn't say how are they going to get anywhere to say as if they can't but the point i'm trying to make is when we look at the statistics and the majority if you have a situation a system that is saying you're no good you're no good you're no good and they're feeding that to you how are you going to rise how are you going to ever be empowered the majority go ahead brother yeah, you raised some great points. I'm just going to be real quick. Jane Elliott, who's the one who did the uh, brown eyes, yes. blue eyes, That's right. whole case study, she opened up a whole whole area of where prejudice lies. And she, she knows that we have to re-educate. But there's one fundamental thing she says. You can't be what you can't see. You know, mm. many of us mm. as black people cannot mm. be that lawyer, doctor, professional educator, uh, pastor, whatever, if we can't see people modeling that ahead of us. But equally, I know this is going to sound really counterintuitive. We've also got to be careful because there are some people who, you know, you can point them in this direction and they can't necessarily see the vision of them being in that position. So, so for instance, I've, I've heard, heard it said in my family already that but dad, I can't do that. I can't get a degree like you've got. And I can't do, mm -hmm. you know, my, my, my daughter said this, um, but she didn't have the vision of her being able to get that degree. And then some, some years later, I noticed she started to go to university. And I said, well, well, how come you're going to university? You didn't tell me about this. And, and anyway, cut a long story short, she took the same course as I did. She's got the same same degree as I've got. And I'm thinking, well, 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 and now her picture is on the wall, along with the other ones where we've got our cap and gowns on, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, my son, I mean, hopefully, we're hoping that he does the same thing. But, 
you can't be what you can't see and you can't expect all of the young men and women to follow the exact same path that you did. Sometimes their timing is different. And if a child or if a young person is following a path which is different to yours, as parents, as better men, better fathers, better um, um, uh, encouragers, we've just got to empower them and support them and believe in them. Even though they may be going in a different direction to the one that we had. I remember I had a friend at church and he used to be, um, he used to work for Birmingham Midshires Building Society. His mom went around the town saying, my son works for Birmingham Midshires Building Society. She was so proud. And then he went to Ireland to launch a credit card and the credit card had a funny name. And he, he said, look, I'm, I'm the, I'm the director of this credit card company and she couldn't understand it. It was a huge job. It was a massive job, but because she couldn't understand it, she couldn't advertise it like she did when he was working for Birmingham Midshires. So we as parents, you know, we think we, we know everything that the kids are doing. We just got to encourage them in their passions because they may do something. It may be something they do in their bedrooms at the moment, maybe something online that turns out to be a massive success. So we've just got to encourage them, make sure they're following the straight and narrow and they're doing principle centered things. But we've got to learn to empower, encourage, believe in our children. We've got to lay enough foundation that, you know, that, that we trust and honor that they will do good things with what we've um, imparted into them. But um, there's a time when you just have to let them go and, and try their own thing and try their own success. And that is tough for any parent to do. I tell you, it's absolutely tough because you know the direction you want them to go in. You've probably got their lap life all mapped out for them, but not necessarily for every kid. So as parents, as men particularly, We've got to be real careful. We have not got all the answers to every single career path. So I just wanted to that. balance that up. Mm. Ryan, let me just go over to the chat room and then we'll take it from there. Welcome everyone. Welcome. Wow. I mean, there's a lot of lot of action going on here, and uh, I, I'm going to have to um, see where we left off. But um, <laughs> let's see, brother Earl and brother Rob will help me out and see if I'm missing anything here. Um, okay. And Sister Christine says teachers always said a black boy could only exceed a GCSE grade C. Yeah. I told my mm -hmm. son that's not true. Teachers always yeah. say anything in the book, black person won't yeah. find. Uh, I think the saying goes, uh, if you want to hide <clears> from, <throat> from a black man put in a book, I have always encouraged them, the more you learn is the more you earn. I don't know if any of you want to comment on that, yeah. but let's read this one first um, and then you can comment. The power of the word, and this is uh, Sister Joyce, welcome. The power of the word and what we speak of our children's lives speak life and power there is a verse um brother rob that says i think it's proverbs 8 in 21 death and life is in the power of the tongue uh, yeah 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 I, and james james talks about it as well doesn't yeah. he in the, in the book of james uh, and and so you know if you're going to use the tongue to speak speak positively because there is power in it you know so yeah choose your words carefully you know, it can cut deeper than a, a knife <laughs> often, you know, and the healing yeah. takes longer once cut with the word. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard it's a hard thing to to manage, you know, but, you know, quickly learn to 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 control the tongue. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure Brad, when you've come across that verse before death and life is in the power of the tongue. And I think that's what you're referring to as well earlier. Mm -hmm um in 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 what we say there was a point i wanted to come back in your presentation on i don't know if there's any thoughts that you have on that Dwayne, at all that you, you want to add to that when are you there can you hear me i think Dwayne may have frozen oh, we may have lost yeah, yeah, yeah. Dwayne may have lost Dwayne. 
Uh, well, Unless he's in shock. That he will, yeah, I'm hoping <laughs> he's not in shock. <laughs> hey, he's, he's, uh, yeah. he's out I'm of sure it. he'll be back in a moment. But th- there is a particular point mm. I wanted to pick up on mm. um, before we close from what, what he said. But let me just go through the chat room. Maybe he'll be back by then. Um, mm. Someone added to what you said earlier, Brother Earl. Good, ma- I'm not sure which one of you said it. Actually, good manners and respect was my parents' yeah. will. Yeah, you in life, yes. Rob. Good manners and respect. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's, that's, a, mm. that's a good one, though, isn't it? Isn't it, Rob? Good manners and yeah, I think, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, I'm going through some situations at work, and um, it's the good manners and respect that has allowed me to to reach out to people that often wouldn't, wouldn't you know, wouldn't, and they, and they tell you that they say it's because of your good manners and respects. I am, I am listening. You, you, you know, uh, you know, because by right, some some people I shouldn't be associated with, you know, if society had their own way. But good manners, respect, because what you're doing, you're empowering them. They may be in even a higher mm. position, but sometimes, mm. you know, they're not mm. in a good place. And when you speak and you encourage and you empower, you know, that goes a long way. And they remember you, you know, a lot of us burn our bridges and then wonder why we don't climb that ladder or cross that road because we burnt down the yeah. bridge, <laughs> you know, and then we get all vexed that, you know, the chip on the shoulder and this, that, and the other. Good manners and respect can go a long way. Mm. But can I say <laughs> one thing, sorry? Yes, go ahead. Because yes, yes, um, yeah. I, I, I forget the lady's name that um, Brother Earl mentioned. He says, you can't be that you can't see. I want to I wanna make that mm. a quote of mine. You can't be that you can't see except through faith because I'm an example of that. You know, mm. um, I was the first, um, as far as I'm, I'm, the, I'm the eldest grandchild, no one told me about university, but you know what? I graduated, I didn't plan to. And so my picture mm. was the first on my grandmother's wall as the person with the, you know, the, the, the cap and the gown and all that mm. stuff. Mm. And it's, it's through faith, you, you know, so you can't be what you can't see. I get the quotes, but I want to add to that and say, except through faith. Okay. That's yeah. right, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Dwayne yeah. is, Dwayne I is think that, that point that, I think Dwayne is back. I think I think we, uh, we didn't frighten you away, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no. I think it was Rachel. I think uh, I think Rachel robbed the internet off me. So uh, yeah, I got it back. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there is a there is I mean there is a point though, um, Dwayne, I wanted to pick up on, and then the, the guys can comment. Is um. And I think this is really is a very powerful point you made. You said um, build build their own program. Now the way I understood that is sometimes we want to give young men what we think they should have, what we want them to have, rather than what they want, and building their program. Are you with me? So, for example. I'll give you a short story and then you come in, Dwayne. Um, I wanted my children to do certain things and they had to read a book a month and they had to do a presentation every month and they had to print a leaflet and they had to promote it and they had to have a minimum of 20 people in that room when they're doing the presentation or they failed. That was my way of empowering them. But one day, one of my daughters, the second one, came to me and said, Dad, can I do a fashion show instead? So she doesn't want to read a book. She wants to do a fashion show. So I said to her, in my heart, I said no. But my, in my, on my lips, I said, go ahead. But in my heart, I said no, because that's not what I wanted for her. Well, on the, she, she designed the program. She invited people. And there was over 50 people in our two front rooms, sitting on the floor, <laughs> sitting all over the place. And I could not believe what I was seeing. And I, I don't even know what's going to happen. She's going to do a fashion show. Anyway, they use the stairs coming down as they, <laughs> as they catwalk the into, into the room, uh, in, into the room through one door and out through the other way and back up the stairs. And Come until on. today, until today, this is around 20 years later, I'm still dazed about what happened that day. Mm-hmm. Now, she's making, now she's making wedding dresses. Now she's yeah. doing all these kind of things. Are you me? Because yeah. I am, yeah. I allowed her to build our own program. Let's mm-hmm. this a little mm-hmm. bit, brother Dwayne. Go ahead, talk about that. Mm-hmm. A little bit. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. Um, sometimes we try to um, almost build our passions or build our goals 
on our young men, um, mm. give them our expectations. Mm. Um, and from, sometimes we fail because uh, if a young person, for example, um, in my local church, a young person said to me, I said to him, I can get you an apprentice, apprenticeship, come and do engineering. He looked at me. And even though it was an opportunity for him, he didn't want it because his passion was mm. accounting. And he wanted accounting. So as I listened to him, and I could see that's where he want, that's that's his passion, that's his goal. I just I went around the church, I found somebody that that's a finance manager, and I says, uh, so and so meet so and so, and over to you. Ask any question you want, and that's just just an example. And we don't want to, um, sort of in let's say in church now, we don't want to make them do a job that they don't want, so they become uninterested. In, in even coming mm. to church, if that makes sense. Sometimes, mm. even if they're coming to church and they're not listening, it's they're still coming to a safe place and they may receive that one word, you know, and that's what it takes, you know. And, and, and I just say that, ask them what their passion is, get to listen to them, find out what's going to drive them and impact them because the impact on that one person, when it's his own thing and it's done correctly and he's been mentored through you really then his passion goes further it goes out further it goes out to his friends he goes out to his families it goes out further because that's his passion pulsing it mm. every night putting it up saying look i'm cooking a uh, you know i'm a cook i'm cooking a healthy diet it goes out further but if it's mine mm. and i push that onto him then maybe mm. this doesn't push it out to or doesn't um have the passion to make everybody I was joining with it and that's where mm. as a church we it's so important because we can we can then impact on more you know we, we can impact on on a, on a on a wider circle you know um mm. when that one person's passion is through the community mm. yeah mm. you're on mute again sir i don't know what you said i keep doing that yes so Dwayne, do you know do you know robert mancini robert mancini <laughs> Yeah, oh yes, said, yes, 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 yes! Yeah, I know, I know him, I know him, I know him. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to get him in the church to be honest. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I preach it to him every day. <laughs> he knows. Brother, awesome. <laughs> He's a good brother, no, a good brother. Good, well, good well, um, I'm going to ask Rob to welcome Robert Mancini. Go ahead, Rob. Yes, well, with the awesome name as Robert. Yes, welcome, man. Big up, big up, Mancini. Yes, big up, brother McCoy. He says, role model for the community. So yeah, whatever you're hesitating on, don't think about it. Just come on board. Knee chills. You got small heat around the corner. So yeah, we we work together. You know. So yeah, yeah big yeah. up, Robert Mancini. No, it's good, good work yes, you're welcome, doing there, brother Dwayne. Mm. Mm. I have to, I have to um, welcome Sister Jean and thank you for reminding me of Psalm 119 verse. 71. Just to let you know, Dwayne, um, I, 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 um, I, I chose to memorize Psalms 119, verse 1 to verse 176. And it's one of the best decisions that I've ever made. It's one of the most empowering things mm -hmm. I've ever done. I've, me I've memorized before, but this one is, is probably one of the hardest things to do, but it it's really is amazing. And we want to say thanks to everyone who have commented in the chat room. And um, we've had uh, a lot of stuff come through, even from um, um, from um, Zoom Pastor as well. Pastor Steve is on there, yeah. Yeah, Pastor oh, okay. Steve, knowledge is power. Yeah, he made a really interesting wisdom. comment there, Steve. He's kind of sharing yeah. an inspiration and sharing a, a situation. Some teachers in my school told me that, I would not achieve much. Words have an impact, but the, mm. thank God he says that um, he broke the mold and we broke the mold. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Absolutely, mm. Pastor Steve, you know, I hear what you're saying, man. And, and that's the thing. It's never too late to change. It's never too late to turn the situation mm. around. Mm. My mom, my mom, when she, after she'd had four kids, went to, went to uh, college and uh, went to university, did A-levels. My mom's an inspiration, so it's never too late to turn this thing never around. So, um, you know, I even encourage if, you. If there was another even comment. If you're <laughs> yeah, well, even if you're 100, I would say yes. But I would say one thing. There was a comment earlier by one of the ladies. I can't remember her name. But basically, you know, if you have GCSEs, that's going to make a difference of tens 
in terms of pounds between you and somebody who doesn't have CS, uh, GCSEs. If you have A-levels, it's going to make difference in terms of hundreds for your earning potential. If you have a, a degree, then it's tens, well, it's thousands of pounds of difference. If you have a master's, your, your earning potential increases by tens of thousands. If you have a doctorate, by hundreds of thousands. So, you know, when you work it out, having a qualification with the right opportunities added to that gives your earning potential so much of a boost. Well, you know, a very, you ask Pastor Steve, he'll tell you. No, that's, that's, that's a powerful point you just made there, actually. I think... Um, I think that needs to be shared, actually. And I, I would love for you to write down what you've just said and send it to me as a part of what we need. Um, what you've just said there, brother. Yeah, I'm going to make a note of it. But we've, we've only got around eight minutes or so left. And I'm going to start with Earl tonight. And then I'm going to finish off with um, Dwayne. Just two minutes each. One takeaway for tonight. Um, your major takeaway. I know I did ask you this question earlier. You might want to stay with the same point or... <laughs> or change it. But I'm giving you one takeaway. Well, if you want to share one two in your two minutes, it's up to you. Yeah, one major takeaway. <laughs> Have you got yours already, Rob? You, are you, you go ahead. I've got Rob. mine. Me, okay, let me go yeah, with Rob then, first then. Go on, Rob. Yeah. Two minutes. I think two, I've, got, I've got two. So, relate. Um, it was something I think Brother Dame was talking about. and We, talked, we, we need to, can be talking about empowerment. So, I don't want to move away from the theme. Right, so we first need to relate to the people that we're talking about, and the statistics show that when we were growing up, there was no one to relate to, so we didn't feel empowered. You know, the teachers, the the, the people in the business, the people in the positions, management. So we need to know how to relate, and to to relate, you need to communicate. You you need to you know, it's not about the preaching. It's it's too easy sometimes to stand on the pulpit and preach to people and think you, you, you're you not relating often, you, you know, and, and so we need to relate and be real, yeah, and then the second bit to that is the encouragement, because you can relate to somebody and then be discouraging, and we're talking about empowerment, you know, we have relations who have disempowered so many people, you know, and Pastor Errol gave advantages, uh, 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 um, examples of that, so what I'm saying is relate you know, stop this facade, you know, putting on this gear of, look, look who I am, I'm such and such. You need to relate and then to encourage with that word. You know, often the encouragement can be through speaking positive word, but you know, sometimes it's just how you do things. You know, young people pick up more on behaviors, you know, rather than what you're telling them. They're very good at picking up, you know, body language, they don't say much generally because they're observing. So relate and encourage, and and that's positive encouragement. So those are my two things. And that, you know, so I'll give them back some seconds. <laughs> yes, I think I think I'm gonna give you a, you a few seconds to, to Earl. <laughs> yeah, man, good idea. <laughs> bless you, bless you. There, there was one thing that Ro, um, that um, Dwayne said in his initial presentation, which I want to land on. But I want to talk about the importance of vision, mission, values, purpose, strategy, having goals and behaving in a particular way. We have to teach young people these principles because they are important to how you see yourself going forward. If you don't have a vision, then, you know, I mean, you see it in the Bible. Errol often preaches this one. If you, without a vision, the people perish. And, you know, write the vision, write it down, make it clear. We've got to teach young people the power of vision, mission, values, purpose, and these things so that they build it into their psyche, that they're going in the direction where they can get something. And the reason I say that is because one of the things that um, I think that Dwayne mentioned in his presentation was about Joshua. Joshua went into the promised land and when he came back, he said to Moses, you know what, I think we can take this place. I want to talk about the other guy who was with Joshua, Caleb. Caleb not only came back with Joshua and saw the vision, but Caleb was actually one of the people who had a vision to say, you know what, I want to fight a battle because Moses said that I could have a piece of land. And I, it's way up there in the top of the mountains and there's a fortress up there. And I know if we could take that fortress, that we would make a clear path for us. 
And Caleb had a vision and he was able to achieve it. And he did it. And he did it in his old age. He was, I think he was about 78, 74, 78. And he said he was still as strong at 78 as when he was 30 years old. That guy had vision. He had mission. He had purpose. He had, he had goals. And I think, you know, this is a key thing that we can teach our young ones. So um, not only do I like the story about Joshua, but I love the story about Caleb. I think it's a brilliant story for our young people to get fired up. If you want to know what vision looks like, look at somebody like Caleb's life. I dare you, look in your Bible, read up on Caleb. What a, what a character, what a fighter, what a warrior. We should have more young people like that with that kind of vision. Brilliant. That's me done. Earl's out. Well, I, I, I can't believe I gave you two and you only gave me one. But anyway, I take that. <laughs> over to you, over to you, um, Dwayne. Your 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 closing two two thoughts. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, uh, first of all, I want to say that we have some really really good role models. We have good people out, uh, good people out there, mm-hmm. good men as well. So we need to make sure that we don't speak negative too much, but we speak positively. Uh, a guy was here last week. He was a pilot, Aaron. So we, mm. they're there, you know, and, and and it can happen. So that shows you that there's that there's hope. Um, and again, for me, it's let's try and you know, as a uh, working with the youth now, let's try and listen to them. Let's try and understand their goals. Let's try and understand what excites them in life, and then let's try and mold that into the in, into the right thing, to, obviously, and try and build upon that so that they they've got that relationship with the elders, uh, with the brothers, and they can grow within under the right uh, ministry with the right people as well. And um, I'm just, I'm, for, I'm throwing it out as an, as, as, a, as almost like a challenge to all churches. Um, um, yeah. To be the place where everyone, everyone knows where to come. Um, mm. The place of help, the place of comfort, the place of safety. To, but yeah, but that's my few words. Thank you very nice. much. Nice. I think I think the two things I would say in closing as well is um, the point that you made early, earlier, and I think this is so so powerful. I don't think you know maybe we we touching a little bit, but question you ask is where is the early intervention? Mm. And I, I I really do think, and I've always said this, the empowerment starts in the home. It really starts in the home. Because sometimes, you know, you, you could send them to school and the teachers are going to say what they say and do what they do and act the way they act. But those children are coming back home where they are taught manners and respect. But if mommy and daddy can be there in a supportive role to kind of say, it doesn't matter what they tell you, son, you can do it. And and, and I wanted yeah. to show you, I was looking for a video um, while you were speaking on my computer and I, I can't remember who showed it to me if it was you Rob or Earl it's of a young man who goes to prison and begin to tell the prisoners how he became successful and to become one of the greatest fourth athlete and he said to the prisoners you know from a very young age my father always said go on son you can do it you can achieve it you 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 can you can keep going son and daddy was there to say all those beautiful things and he became an international champion. And one of the prisoners said to him, you know, I have a similar story as well. My dad did tell me from a very young age that I was no good, <laughs> that I was stupid, that I would never make it. Just the same story I had. And the two young men ended up in... Ooh total different part of the spectrum are you with me one ended Mm. up in the highest in success and the other one in the lowest in failure and and i can resonate with that and it's that early intervention for example Dwayne, you've got some children i think you told us earlier you got three i think rob you mentioned you got three and so on and so forth i've got six and and even though my my youngest sorry my oldest daughter is 40 i'm still a father and I still have the ability to sow into their lives. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And I think that early intervention is so key and so vital. 
The second thing I would share is that, um, is that, and I love this thought, is that Joseph, Joshua walked with Moses. That's what you said, mm. right? Joshua walked mm. with Moses. And I want to tell you a story about Joshua. God told Moses that he is to get to build the tabernacle and only Moses mm. was supposed to be in the tabernacle. And when you read the story carefully, there are times when Joshua built, built it and did not come out. Mm. Are you following me? And God came in and you, we saw later what happened to, to that. And the question I would ask, and I've been asking even all the men, that's why I keep on saying we've got to have succession planning, we've got to have assistance. Who is walking with us? Who is it? Who are these young men walking with? You know, when you talked about mentorship today uh, and things like that. And so those are my two key thoughts tonight. Um, where is the early intervention? And who is walking with these young men? Because if Satan walk with them, we know where's, what's going to happen. If they, if they get into the wrong crowd, we know what's going to happen. Who is walking with these young men? Gentlemen, I want to say this tonight was amazing. And, and guess what? We're just in time. Wow. Can you mm. believe that, Rob? I, I can believe it. Yeah, man. It's good. It's awesome. And I feel energized. Awesome. Yes. Good stuff. Well, mm. we'll be, no doubt we're going to have Dwayne back at some point. Yes. And I uh, want to say, wow, Dwayne, you've really done amazing job tonight and you know one thing i've learned you know gentlemen is that no matter who we bring each week they bring a different dimension don't they they bring a different that's right last week it kind of Actually. way towards um you know sort of like mental health in some aspect mm -hmm. i got among education but there are different ways in which we can empower our young men and we've got to continue to do so Dwayne, thank you very much sir and uh, I see that you had a lot of supporters here tonight. And uh, I, I must say, Maria, we're going to get Maria in the show because Mar Maria, yeah, you need I must to, say, you guys, need to, yeah, you need to, yeah. she is, <laughs> no, she, she's just truly amazing. Um, mm. So I'm going to set it up. Um, she's amazing. Um, she's been on before. She's been on quite a few times on a Wednesday night. We used to have youth yeah. focus and she was, in fact, actually, Dwayne, um, and Leon was here. We used to have Wednesday night was youth, was youth night. So Wednesday night was you focus. So if you and Sister um, um, Sister Rachel with Maria wants to help me on a Wednesday night, I can switch the program up so that Wednesday night could be you focus every Wednesday or whenever you guys want to. So um, think about it, and um, yeah. you know you can you guys can take that platform and do what you guys do, and I'd just be here to just help you guys out so think about it because it takes the weight off me as well because i have to do something if nothing is there so think about it and then come back to me and let me know and if you don't then i'll just speak to mary and ask her to help me so, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah because it, yeah there's a lot that you guys can do and, and even with young men as well as well get some young men yourself aaron think about it and come back to me and, and we go okay. So yeah. we, we come back to that. But I want to say thanks. Brother Earl, Brother Rob, thank you so got much, very, very much. Thanks. And uh, yeah, man, see you guys next week. And, okay, uh, we Brother Dwayne, bless you. Join us. Thank you, guys. Thank, you guys. Thank, you guys. Okay, guys. thank you, Dwayne. All the best. All, right. all the best, Pastor Earl. Take care, Brother yes, Rob. Brother all Earl. the best, mate. Take all care. Bye. Yeah, all the best, guys. Well, I just want to say thanks to an amazing, another amazing night as well. Uh, wow. Dwayne is amazing. Um, really amazing. I'm sure his his wife will be very pleased, and I think when he comes off the set, his wife is going to give him the biggest hug and kiss he's ever had in his entire life since his wedding day, by the way. And uh, <laughs> so, um, well done, well done, amazing. Now we're going to be writing a lot of these things up that we've received, so they're not going to just fall in deaf ears and type of thing like that. But I just want to let you know as well that we do have a conference coming up with um, everything that we're doing will culminate into uh, on that day, the 12th of June. And that's going to be in Zoom. It won't be on this platform. It will be in Zoom. So we want everyone to register. We are opening doors to men and women, male and female um, can come, young and old can come. 
and it will be led by our national men's ministry department, myself, Brother Earl, Brother Rob, as well as Dwayne and Aaron Christopher, who uh, has joined the national men's ministry department. And uh, we had a meeting today, a really awesome meeting. Uh, all the regional men turned up and so on. It really was amazing. And so um, we want everyone to be there, be involved. It's on a Saturday, 4 to 7. So please, please come and join us as well in that. Um, I want to also let you know as well that we do have, on Sunday evening, we do have the Illuminate session coming up. And uh, you can join us uh, for that. W what I have said is this, is that um, every day, Monday to Friday, um, the online Bible studies, men's focus, etc., Monday to Friday, 9 to 10.30, if the session finishes at 10.30, and whoever wants to stay behind for around 15 minutes to half an hour, I, I will then talk about a completely unrelated, different subject, and it's to do with HBCC, a company called HBCC, an organization, a community initiative called HBCC for anyone who wants to hear about it, and then I will talk about that after the Bible study. So if you need to leave, then you can, but every night from around... Well, when I finish the Bible studies, then I will go into that HBCC for those of you who want to. So I'm going to go into that now and then um, just talk about it. And then I said I, I will always share one lesson every night, one lesson from my book. And I'm going to share one tonight. So stay with me if you can. And um, I'm going to switch over. But I want to just switch over with an advert. Um, this is Leonard Johnson. He's my very first boss that I've ever had, that I've ever worked with. And he's still my boss today. Can you believe that? He's still my boss. Now, tomorrow we're going to have a live interview, right? Um, and the details are there. I would love for you to take um, that detail down. That is the website, hbcc.live. That's where the show will be held. And um, love for you to join us. It's just a one hour, five o'clock to 6 p.m. tomorrow. Um, so I'd love for you to come and join us um, if you're able to do so tomorrow. Or you can also join us in Zoom. You can also join this session in Zoom um, if you so, um, um, so wish. You can join us in Zoom. But um, we, will be, um, we will be here tomorrow. Um, five to six, and I will be interviewing the chairman, Leonard Johnson. So I hope you can make it um, with us tomorrow um, from five to six. So make a note of that if you don't mind, and uh, then we will bring all that details to you um, tomorrow. Now, as I made mention before, um, um, Thank you all, those of you that have to go, appreciate your being here, really do. And thank you so very much for, for, for popping by. Now, what actually happened is that um, uh, I got involved in an organization in 1981, that's right, 1981. And uh, it was called HBCC, and we took over a disused um, bus garage project and uh, we three and a half acre site and we had to raise 1.8 million pounds um, in six months we were able to do it in less than that being able to raise 1.8 million pounds and that's what we uh, had to do and um, this gentleman here that you see here Leonard Johnson um, was the instigator of that he was the one who um, led the campaign for us to be able to raise that funds. And I'm telling you, this guy is truly, you know, something else. He's a really dynamic leader. And um, he has done an amazing, amazing job. And uh, I'm delighted tomorrow to have an interview with him tomorrow. And he will be talking about HBCC, how it started back in 1981, and so on. So if you can join us, that would be great. Again, the details are there, uh, HBCC. 
Um, we later, those of you that may walk past Bridge Park may see this particular picture, um, and that's the front entrance of, of it. And inside of it, you would see, um, you, we saw the iTech and business unit, 32 business unit, thir uh, uh, well, 32 business unit, 16 was industrial, and 16 were office space. We had a sports center, a training center, restaurant wine bar we had a crash we had a high tech we had a sports center football cricket you name it it was just truly phenomenal that's where i learned most of my it skills that i'm using um, today we had marvelous marvin agler we've had so many people that visited the, the web the, 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 the organization now if you want to take a copy of my book um, you can have a copy of it. It's free at the moment until it will be paid for, but I'm giving it away free at the moment. It's just a PDF form. And just go to bit.ly right at the top there, bit.ly, HBCC bad. It will take you to my personal website. And then there's a download link, and you can download the PDF copy. We're also having a public meeting on the 3rd of May. And we're celebrating 40 years of service in the community. Believe it or not, that's how long I've been serving the community. Listen to this carefully. 40 years, day and night, nonstop for 40 years. I want to say it again. Nonstop, every day, 40 years. That's how long we've been serving. Uh, and uh, it truly has been a, a remarkable mark of a story. And and this is this was our last is public meeting where we had over six seven hundred people standing room only um, because we are in court with London Bar of Brent right now today as I speak uh, we are in court we're going to be in court with them again because we have appealed a decision by the judge and uh, we'll be back in court with them very very soon and uh, nothing new to us. Um, it's the ongoing saga. So I said I would share with you uh, one uh, lesson that I learned per day. Okay, so I've shared two so far. Number one was beware of those you invite to help you. If you're running a community project, charity, even a church, which is also a charity and a community organization, if you like, Always beware of those that you invite to come and help you. It's, you, you. You need people and to work with you. You need people to help you because one man can't build you know, a big edifice. You know, it takes people, but you must be aware. You've got to operate in such a way that um, if people sting you, then it doesn't really affect you that much. Second thing I pointed out, which was yesterday, is never, ever, well, let me, put, let me say how I've written it, never, comma, never sign a blank check, ever. We did, and it cost us way over a hundred thousand pounds. I explained what happened yesterday. It cost us way over a hundred thousand pounds. I, I can't begin to tell you much more than that it's because it's a lot of money because we signed a blank check and it was used incorrectly. I spent five days in court listening to the case. Uh, five days completely out of, my, out of my life, every day of that week to listen to that particular case. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't just five days because that was in a criminal case and I had to spend more days in the, in the, in the um, civil court as well. So was a lot of money that we lost because we signed a blank check. Never, comma, never sign a blank check, ever. I'm going to read a very small section. Um, and my third lesson that I learned is this. A friend loves at all times. I'm talking about friend not an acquaintance not somebody that you just meet but a friend loves at all times and i read this section a little bit 
when all hell breaks out against you. Only your true friends will remain. Even your spouse, brother, or children may walk out on you when the going gets tough. Lots of people want to ride with you in the limo. But what you want is someone who will take the bus with you when the limo breaks down. This is from Oprah Winfrey. Now, there's more to it than that, but that's just all I would read. What I noticed in, in this bridge park was something remarkable. While we were successful in the Information Technology Center and the ITEC, while we were successful in the crash and our football team was winning the league, our basketball team was winning the league, our netball team was winning the league, our darts team was winning the league. This is not just fiction. Our, our um, um, squash team was winning the league, the badminton team. Uh, it was just absolutely amazing what was going on. We had the community. Talk about empowering young people. This was the epitome of empowerment. While we were being successful, while we was in the newspaper, nationally, locally, we were on the TV, nationally, locally, while we are building and while we've invited Prince Charles, and Prince Charles came and launched the project in 20th of December, 1988, we had 1,500 people in the sports hall. Sorry, 1,250 people in the sports hall. People in other parts of the building. People outside in the car park. What I noticed while we were being successful, everyone was saying they were our friends. <laughs> they sat with us. They ate with us. They gave us money, they gave us support, they gave us everything that we asked for. And I'm not kidding you. Anything we wanted, we were like we were eating out of their hand. Anything we wanted, we were getting. Until trouble broke out. Some of the troubles that we, and I will speak of the challenges later, but some of the trouble that we started to have is, you know, we had two murders outside the building, not in the building. People were leaving the discotheque and someone killed someone outside the building, but we got blamed. So the newspaper would say something like, the royal opening by Prince Charles project, murder at the project, things like that. And they're always associated with Prince Charles and then the project because that's how you sell newspaper. Bad news sell newspaper. So the moment the going got tough is when we began to see who our true friends really were. Because your true friend, when all hell breaks out against you, only your true friends will remain. That's why Jesus said, you'll always know a tree by its fruits, right? So, here we are. Now, I want to say this as well, is that everyone has trouble. You know, if you end up in prison tonight, you will know your true friends are the ones who's going to write to you and come and visit you and try and help you, even if you're guilty. And I want to end in a story. And I've said this before, and I will end in this story for tonight. In the, in the mid, the peak of the trouble that we experience, finding ourselves being liquidated by the authorities, all kind of things going on against us. We had no more visit to the project from anybody, reputable or so. Nobody wouldn't come and visit us. But a white man turned up. He turned up. And he never did leave. 
he was there when we, the going was good. He was there when the going got bad, and he came to visit us. And we talked, and he shared some ideas with me. His nephew, his name, and I'll say his name tonight. His name is Mr. Jeff Parson. I met him, um, and it was through him that I met Earl. Earl Lynch, the incredible Earl Lynch that was on the show tonight. It was through Mr. Um, Parson, Jeff Parsons, that I met Earl. I went to visit his organization to learn how he was doing things so we can bring some of that lesson back to where we were. And it was at that particular encounter that we, I met Earl and we, we, we struck up friendship and we've been friends ever since. And when the going was really, really good, he was there. He was there to support us, to give us help and advice. And when the going got bad, now we are being liquidated. Now we are in an embarrassing position. He did not leave. He was still there, this white gentleman. And he came one day to see me, as he did many, on many other occasions. And we talked, and he shared with me, and we shared together. And while he was leaving, while he was leaving, he asked me a, a very embarrassing question. <laughs> One that really troubled me. He said, he, he was, I remember he, was, he had walked away, finished, we had concluded our conversation. And then he, as if he had an afterthought, afterthought and he turned around and he called me. And I turned back to him and walked to him. He says, I want to ask you a question. How's your family? I'd, nobody ever asked me that question. How is your family? I said, uh, you know, everyone's okay. And then he asked the crunch question. He said, how much money do you have left to keep you and your family? And I held my head down. I, I, I was embarrassed. And I said, only one month. I have one month's money left. I don't know what I'm going to do <laughs> after that because I put my entire being into trying to save Bridge Park for the black community. So that's who Bridge Park was primarily for. It's for the old community, but it was the black community primarily that we were after. And he then asks me a question, another question. He says, how much money would you need to get on your feet? And I said to him, around six months money would put me back on my feet. Six months and I'll be back on my feet. Because and in a way, I was really, one would say, irresponsible because my family should have been priority. But. It's hard when you're trying to save a project. You're trying to save something that you believe in. It's kind of hard. I mean, I can't explain it more than that. And I would accept what people say if you like. But anyway, he then left and he, he went away and he's gone. A few days later, he sent me an envelope with a check in it, a six-month salary. <laughs> Until today, you know, 30 years on or so, 25 or so years on, I, I cannot forget that. Uh, you know, it's not something that you just sweep under the carpet, that you just forget about. Um, you know, because he saved me a great deal of embarrassment. And I am so grateful and still I'm grateful and still I'm indebted to that man for what he did for me and my family and for the organization. Not just in the finances, but in his support, in his encouragement. And even throughout that period, as we were going through things, I remember a time, Bishop Mike and I, during that same time, we were running training programs for unemployed people, empowering young people. And I believe, Bishop, this is, this is what I believe. And this is just my, my, me saying that. I believe Bishop Mike Wilson and I developed the most empowering program for young people that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. 
And we were running that program one day. And while we were running the program, Jeff was there, turned up there in a room by himself with Leonard, encouraging us, talking to us and helping us. This is the things that this man was doing. And I am so glad. And it's just to honor this man and to say thanks to him for this exceptional effort. You will always know your friend. Not when the going is really good, but when the going is really bad. Because as I said before, when all hell breaks out against you, only your true friends will remain. I want to say thank you all so much for tuning in to tonight, and I'm going to leave it right there tonight. But if you can join me tomorrow and visit the website, hbcc.life, it's the website, hbcc.life. All the details are there. You can sign up for our newsletter, register for um, the public meeting coming up, watch the live show there tomorrow. Also watch it on Zoom as well, the details are there, the Zoom number, the everything is there um, that you would need to have a look at. Look around, look at the blog, look around, leave your comments, leave your messages for us, and we will be delighted to hear from you. We're trying to enlist as much support as we can from people around the country and, uh, and even the world if we have to. I want every person in the UK to know what devils we are up against who lie and deceive and and the judge believe them the, the, the previous case that we went to the judge one judge set the case and believed what um they said and we have appealed against it and another judge says we do have a strong case um so it granted us um, leave to appeal and we're going to fight until the very last drop of blood left in my vein <laughs> we're not going to give up uh, and I want to show you this that if someone were to say to me Errol how much money do you think you lost or the black community lost or we lost over Bridge Park being lost how much money do you think you can value this project and you will come up with something like maybe 50 to 150 million. That's probably the value that you would um, come up with somewhere along that line, maybe even more. But I want to tell you what I think we have lost. We haven't lost 150 million. We've lost billions because of the potential of what it would do elsewhere and beyond in terms of the dream and the vision that we have. And the great thing about this is that even if we lose the court case that we're appealing against, it doesn't mean the dream is lost. It just means we've lost that building. That's all it means. It just means we've lost that building. But we are, you know, we have an amazing chairman. I mean, it's just truly one of the most incredible chairman. And what's interesting as well, and I've said this before, is that, and as, and I, you know, make this, make this, um, comment I made earlier that Leonard is, for me, one of the greatest community leaders in the UK. In 40 years of service, incredible leadership. I mean, I was, I, I was, at the time, I was not a visionary. A visionary is one who sets vision. They can see into the future. I couldn't do that. I was not that. I was the guy that, you just tell me what you want, and it's done. That's, that's, that's me, and, and still that's me today. You say to me, you want it that way, you want it over there, you give me the vision, I'm going to make it happen. That's, that's where I stepped in. And there are times when I didn't have a clue what direction to turn. And just five minutes in Leonard's present, <laughs> and I was on fire. And, you know, in my book that, if you download it, I tell a little bit of the story. Uh, of him. There are three men that inspired me and empowered me. Talking about empowerment, there are three men that empowered me and, and has inspired me um, that I've had the opportunity to, to be with. Leonard Johnson, Michael Wilson, and Bishop P.F. Foreman. 
When you're talking about empowerment, you're talking about inspirational, you're talking about amazing over a long period of time. I mean, I can't really actually find the words to communicate and to express how powerful these men were in my life. That I would never have become the person I am today had it not been for them. It just would not have happened, I don't think, uh, in my own personal opinion. But if you can join us tomorrow, five to six, it's just one hour. Start at five, finish at six. Uh, come and join us. Come and join us in the fight. We're trying to get as much people as possible to join us in this fight. Uh, and if you can help us, praise the Lord. If not, Praise the Lord. <laughs> so join us if you can. And I want to say again, thank you so much, guys. Wish you all the best. You know that. If there's anything I can do to help you guys, support you guys, you've got my number. Call me, contact me, and I'll be there to help. Take care of yourself, guys, and have yourself a phenomenal week. Until next time. Bye for now.